welcome again to another episode of the official Cyblogs podcast. I'm Al. I'm Amy. And we have our usual collection of interesting stories throughout the week. So, without further ado, we might as well just jump into probably the biggest story of this week, which is, of course, uh, the awarding of the Prime Minister's Science Prizes for 2011. And there was a really nice mix uh, this particular year, though they do t- did tend to have a rocky kind of icy bent to some of them, not all of them. And we'll just run through them quickly and, and why the scientists actually got them. So uh, the big one, the Prime Minister's Science Prize, the main one uh, worth $500,000, has, drumroll please, <laughs> been awarded to a team of scientists from NIWA. Uh, and they also work at the University of Targo for research into bioengineering. And this is seriously cool. So the winning team uh, comprises a whole bunch of different people, but what they actually did is they studied um, phytoplankton. So they studied little critters that live in the ocean and their effects on the global climate. The idea behind their research was that uh, if you put iron in the water where some of these phytoplankton actually live, you can cause massive algal blooms. The idea behind that was that it would remove substantially more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than is normal. And this would go uh, a step along the way towards uh, towards uh, combating the effects of global warming and you know general pollution of our atmosphere. So uh, they, this research group went out and they tried this and the interesting thing is that they got a negative result. So uh, somewhat, un, um, somewhat obviously it's a really complex system, it's really really hard to model and when they tried it they found that not only did the phytoplankton not take up as much carbon dioxide as they were expecting, they also released a whole bunch of other gases and there were a whole bunch of other side effects. So they essentially said this is not the way to solve global warming but the research itself is still exceedingly cool. So I think they definitely deserve that uh, that main prize. Yeah, this, uh, this, this type of work is also sometimes called geoengineering by some people and it's being looked at more and more as, as a potential sort of huge large scale way um, to solve some of the issues around climate and also energy but but we're still very sort of newly into the field and it still uh, causes quite a lot of discussion each way. Yeah, sorry. I did mean geoengineering. I just (laughs) said bioengineering. Uh, Bioengineering is something slightly different, (laughs) but still exceedingly cool. So uh, the second of the Prime Minister's Science Prizes is the McDermott Emerging Scientist Prize, and this went to uh, a Wellington scientist from Victoria University, Dr. Rob uh, McKay, who's a sedimentologist, a glacial sedimentologist. And what he's been doing is he's been looking at the melting and cooling episodes in Antarctica over the past 13 months million years and their influence on the global sea levels and climate. So once again, big, uh, big climate change research there. Uh, the Science Teacher Prize, which we'll come back to in more detail a wee bit later on, went to Dr. Angela Sharples, uh, which one of our cybloggers um, from Bioblog, Alison Campbell, mm-hmm. um, has written a really excellent blog explaining uh, in detail why Angela uh, deserves this prize. She's currently head of biology at Rotorua Boys High School, so you know, if you're in the area, swing by and meet someone famous. <laughs> um, and essentially they gave it to her because they attribute her presence to reversing a decline in the number of students studying biology at school across the country. Right. And reading uh, Alison's post, it seems like she definitely deserves it. The 2011 Future Scientist Prize went to a Year 13 student at the Auckland Diocesan Thank you, Amy. <laughs> School for Girls. Uh, and the project uh, went to Nguang Ting Wang. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Her project was called I Think, and it was uh, applied to neurobiology. She, if she studied the effects of um, concentration on pupil size, on the size of the, the pupils within your oh. retina, and compared that with the development of short-sightedness, which is really, really cool, especially because she's only a year 13 student. Yes, so her interest was sparked by uh, members of her family, I believe, amongst other things, and, and she was just curious about whether there's really anything to the, the common, I guess, belief that, you know, or short-sighted people can be smarter or, like, wearing glasses makes you look smarter kind of thing. Oh, cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep my mouth firmly shut around that one, I think. He doesn't wear glasses yet. I do. <laughs> uh, I don't wear glasses because when I do, my eyesight is so appalling, they make my eyes shrink. So I wear contacts so that my eyes don't do the tiny shrink thing in my face. <laughs> my eyesight's just appalling, which is why I'm trying to keep quiet about it. Right, 
And the final prize uh, this year is the Prime Minister's Science Media Communication Prize. And this went to Dr. Mark Quigley, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Canterbury. And he became well known um, as the kind of science spokesperson around the Christchurch earthquakes. And this guy is just, he's just amazing. So he published seven peer-reviewed research articles on the quakes. He delivered more than 40 published lectures. He ran a website while living in the condemned red zone in a house surrounded by liquefaction with no sewage, no water, and no power all the time um, fielding public requests for information and the science behind the quakes. And he just did an absolutely fantastic job. So congratulations to him. That's absolutely extraordinary. And, and well done to, to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Amy, the next one's yours, I think. Um, yeah, it is. Right. So this is about uh, decision making, actually. And it's about how bees make decisions. And, and it's quite interesting because this is a, a case of, of convergent evolution. Like, like, I mean, it's just extraordinary. Now, to go back a couple of steps, um, if you look at the human brain, right, we've got billions of neurons in, in our brains. Um, and each of these collects uh, information. And then sort of uh, as a whole, a response is, is determined kind of thing. Now, in some cases, you actually get groups of neurons, uh, neurons competing for an outcome, so, so they, they want different things to happen. And when a, when a group that's part of a competing group of neurons reaches a sort of a certain level of activity, basically, its output ends up being chosen. So I guess a very crude analogy could be like, if it's shouting the loudest, it gets chosen kind of thing. So is this similar to the kind of quorum sensing thing? Um, it could be, yeah. It really, it very, very much could be. I, that's a little bit different because that's that's bacterium, um, but but uh, I'm well, I'm not sure. <laughs> it sounds like there may be something uh, something there. Um, yeah. So with with these um, uh, neurons, to to sort of help strengthen cases, neurons can actually send positive signals to each other, but they can also inhibit uh, neurons that they that they don't agree with, basically. Um, and the idea is that this increases the, the chance for the whole system to come to an optimal decision when you've got, you know, different groups of, of competing outcomes. Now, it turns out bees do this as well, um, which is, is fairly new information, but, but fairly interesting information. And <clears throat> um, what bees do is, is they can also hinder other, other hive mates or other bees in their hive that are advocating a different course of action to them. And so much like the brain, you, you get a sort of a collective decision when you get a particular threshold, when one group is making a lot more noise than the others. Now, bees do it physically. They don't send out, you know, uh, neurotransmitters or chemical signals. They actually headbutt each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so a really good example of this in action is when a group of honeybees decide to create a new colony. So you'll have your queen bee and you'll have thousands of other bees, and they all sort of set off into the great unknown. And scout bees um, are a group of, of bees within this new hive, this proto-hive, that have been given the, the task of finding a suitable new nest place and coming back to their group with its location. Now, uh, the famous waggle dance that people have seen and that they teach in biology and things, that's, that's, um, they use that dance to talk about new locations, for example. But, of course, as you can imagine, is not all scouts are going to come back with the same answer. Um, depending on where they've been. So, so then how do you decide if you've got a number of scout bees um, uh, sort of saying and clamoring and shouting, you know, we, we have the best place, what do you do? So what apparently scout bees will do is they will headbutt other scouts who don't agree with them. And this headbutt transfers a vibrational signal that, that um, when it's repeated enough times causes the other bee to stop dancing completely. So again, you're <laughs> getting this, this threshold here is that once you've got enough scouts that, you know, well, um, what would you call them, competing scouts, scouts who were advocating other places, once they've been headbutted into submission, then the decision's made and the swarm will move to the, the winning um, nest site, which is really quite interesting. And so the, um, the researchers behind this created a, an analytic model. Um, they use differential equations and, and sort of non the, the knowledge rather that they've picked up looking at bees over the years. And... Um, it showed that that's this sort of this what they call cross inhibition is actually pretty necessary for the swarms to reach a decision because you can imagine without an inhibitory signal, where um, scouts have the ability to change each other's minds but not shout the other bees down, is you might not ever end up in a situation where you've got um, 
a, a sort of a very stable situation. People will keep persuading the other guys and persuading the other guys, and, and then no decision will ever be reached. So a really, really interesting piece of um, research, and, and I can't help wondering if, if it's not something that we could bear in mind sometimes with, with other human decision-making. Well, I think so, right? Because the, the cool thing here is that because it's such a, a physical, intimate process of, of limiting um, limiting the effect, right? Because because a bee has to headbutt another bee, right? One bee can't headbutt hundreds of thousands of other bees. There's probably a practical limit to it, maybe maybe 50 or so before it like, breaks its neck in half, right? Mm. It limits the if efficacy, the, the kind of range that one bee can have in the hive, so it prevents one bee from headbutting all the other bees into submission and taking over. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas, I, I, you know, I think in human... Uh, in human society now, especially with social media, right? You have things like memes, which one person that produces, and essentially you can headbutt, you know, Millions a few people. billion people. Because <laughs> we've taken the physicality out of it. Yeah. Whereas if you had to do that in real life, you'd probably at very least get kind of tired. Ah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that's that. That's that's pretty cool.